welcome to Art Fermented, Comparative Experimentation in Medieval Brewing. I'm Rihanna Phillips. And I'm Brian Costello. Oh, thank you. So today we will explore medieval brewing techniques, processes, and ingredients. We will compare medieval to modern brewing using the same base recipe and hopefully achieve an overall understanding of the historical and archaeological aspects of brewing, its development, and its role as an art form. So, both of us are PhD students in archaeology here at the University of Chester. In our spare time, we are all grain home brewers, which means we brew from scratch. Um, and, as, as follows, amateur beer connoisseurs. So, as a result of all of our experimentation, which we will detail, um, we brought our final batch, Medieval, <laughs> which is available for you to sample during the break. Um, it's vegan friendly, but contains gluten, so we encourage you to experience um, along with us. All right, so just talking beer in our present day. In the last 20 years, we saw this rise of craft beer, or in this country, it started as real ale, you've probably all heard of. Um, this has been a global phenomenon across the planet, where it started in the United States, where small microbreweries and small businesses started up creating new beer styles or bringing back old beer styles. And beer has become an art culture in its own form, let alone the artwork that goes on to beer. But just the brewing techniques, the styles they're doing, the different crazy things they're doing. One brewery tried to put burgers and cheese in a beer once, so that was kind of nuts. But overall, the, even head brewers themselves, I've been seeing head brewers asking for autographs, people trying to get their autograph. Or a head brewer doing an entire PhD on one yeast strain, which is pretty impressive for one yeast strain that goes into beer. So beer itself is its own culture now. A uh, quick overview of brewing. Of course, recent excavations have just found uh, the earliest evidence of beer brewing at the Natufian culture 13,000 years ago. Um, and we're talking about medieval Britain, uh, Britain specifically, and commercial brewing, which almost is exclusively done by women before the mid-15th century. And they were called brewsters. Um, one such brewster was Denise Marlier, who died in 1401 after brewing commercially for over 20 years in her local area. Um, we know that her will bequeathed a large amount of brewing equipment, an extensive amount. Um, and through other records, we can tell that brewing was generally a small business venture, but could be very profitable um, and conducted in, out of either their own homes or small brew houses nearby and was sold mainly just to the local populace. It wouldn't be exported beyond the, the area they lived in. Um, through other records, we see that this was a very common pursuit for women. In some areas, over one-third of the women in a particular um, area was involved in brewing. Um, for instance, Wakefield, between 1348 and 1350, had 185 registered brewsters. Um, eventually, in the mid-15th century, this growth of the brewing as a lucrative business led to an eventual takeover of male brewers in big breweries. So what is brewing? Basically, it's barley's heated, releases sugars, and yeast eats those sugars, producing alcohol. That's simplified the brewing process. Moving on, we have many terms, but basically looking at the modern brewing technique, uh, we have the mash, recirculation, boil, cooling, all the things all breweries have to do to produce beer. The only difference we found is in the medieval technique, it's a longer mash and the boil's kind of combined, but there's no what's called the sparge, or recirculation. This is when you re rinse the grains after you heat them to get all of the sugar out, as much sugar as possible. And you put more heated water in to really get the efficiency and get as much sugar out as you, you possibly can. This didn't start taking place until the 19th century. So the medieval beer would not have this sparge. Um, so the basic ingredients of any modern beer, um, as was stated, was barley, water, yeast, and hops. And the only real difference between that and the medieval basic recipe um, is no hops. Instead, perhaps some herbs and spices would have been used, but um, hops were not used in, in medieval Britain. Um, herbs and hops, these all provide flavor. Um, some other herbs that would have, would have been used in place could have been cinnamon, mint, spruce, yarrow, bog myrtle, rosemary, heather. Um, and because of this, hops they acted as a preservative in beer. They still do. They preserve beer. It's why we can buy them in the grocery store and, and drink them today. 
Um, and hops were used in other areas, such as on the continent, but not at this time in medieval Britain. Um, so, as a, as a result of the fragmentary evidence and uh, of ingredients, equipment, um, our project was a true experimental archaeology. Um, we also know that two types of beer were mainly brewed in medieval Britain at this time. A strong sort of occasion beer, a high alcohol content, and then your everyday drinkable low percentage weak beer, which would have been more fortifying. So for the methodology of this experiment, we use basic ingredients that would have been around in medieval Britain at the same time, same type, of course, species of ingredients change, but we didn't use any uh, hops. We had no sparge or recirculation. We had a short fermentation time, uh, no carbonation. We did five batches, uh, four medieval and one modern to do a comparison batch to see the same recipe brewed in the modern way compared to the medieval way. The ingredients chosen, we used basic pale malt, oats, which malt and oats in the medieval period is called dredge. That was the basic uh, malt backbone. And we used two yeast strains, trying both Windsor yeast and Nottingham yeast, which are two of the older styles around. A lot of the old bitters use them in the day. So it's really the closest thing we come to a British yeast that would have been used. And the two herbs we chose were rosemary and yarrow. We were going to use bog myrtle, but further research shows it could cause hallucinogens, hallucinogenic effect. <laughs> Though that would have been hilarious for us to watch this. We're like, nah, we'll, we'll keep it safe. Maybe, so. Maybe not good. <laughs> the recipe we created was, of course, there was no written recipe step by step from the high to late medieval period. Most of the recipes we have come from the Elizabethan era and after. So we sort of, this was testing what could make a drinkable beer that won't kill you uh, <laughs> and see how it goes. And we created this and of course each batch we had to change some things and find some things that didn't work, like play with it a bit, just as brewsters and brewers would have done back in the day and still do today. So our first batch, our first test of this, of course we had to make the barrel ready and everything as well, but we used dredge and yeast, but we did not use any of the herbs in batch one. A lot of the very weak early beers wouldn't have any. It was just sold for the working class on a daily basis. They may not have had it. But the goal was to create 8 to 10 liters and ferment for five days, and barreled right after fermentation. The outcome, the appearance, as you can see, kind of looks murky. Uh, a little bit like opaque like milk, like milky orange juice, which is kind of creepy to think about. Um, but the tasting notes, it was stale and soured and a bit footy. So just think we had a whole barrel like, wow, we got to dump this. This is bad. And it was pretty rough. The uh, mouthfeel is medium, uh, only created four liters. We underestimated the amount of water it would take to do it the medieval way, specifically without the sparge or recirculation. Mm -hmm. um, the beer was stale after five days and the approximate alcohol percentage was two to three percent. Uh, what we learned from this, the failures had some successes as well. Uh, we discovered that without hops, beer had to be drank fresh. The key thing is without the preservative effect, it would go stale. It's like leaving bread out on the counter and just what happens to it? You know, it goes bad. That's what happened with this. This, enforced, this is also enforced by a historical record of a lot of brewsters and brewers being fined for selling old beer. This is in the record from this period. So this is a common occurrence we discovered firsthand. Uh, we also discovered that the recirculation of sparge technique invented in the 19th century was so much better for brewing. Medieval brewing is inefficient. The amount of malt you use without recircling could have made like a 9% beer, but in the end we only got a 3%. And that's really about the short time because of no hops and the no sparge. So really we're finding out the evolution of beer has come a very long way. So moving on from there, we took what we learned, we increased the water amount, we decided to attempt using rosemary and yarrow for flavor. Um, we estimated the amount um, that to put in by how many, how many hops, the same amount of hops you would add to a modern IPA to provide flavor um, for the same amount of beer produced. We fermented this for three days. Um, the outcome was just like the previous beer in color, very opaque, and the yarrow and rosemary added a very light, zesty, floral, herbal flavor, a little bit of a tangy astringency. Um, so we overall learned to correct the amount of water um, and we're moving on from there. Now the third batch was the modern one. And for this, we decided to use the same recipe as batch two, fixing the water and everything. But we did put a little bit of hops in it so we could do an entire modern fermentation as well as a bottling and carbonation process. We got at this as we chose common hops because they don't have a lot of flavor profile for the style of hops. A little bit of lemony, a little bit Just of grapefruit, but more for preservation. Really not enough that we thought 
to affect the flavor of the beer. And we fermented it for two weeks. Uh, the outcome was the same color, yet the taste, the mix of yarrow, rosemary, and hops was not good. It really... It was uh, as subdued as we hoped. It, it kind of <laughs> enforced the yarrow and the rosemary's dryness and made it almost like an acidy burn in the back of your throat, just slightly. And it got to the point where it's like, great, now we have all these bottles that we took, and now it's undrinkable as well, which are plenty, plenty over there if you'd like one. So, the modern so. and the medieval. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, overall, we learned that this didn't work. You know, the one thing that we did learn is the modern technique does produce the alcohol you'd expect, as in 5 to 6%. That was the approximation we got from the modern way. Now, the fourth batch. We repeat the same as number two, except we switched from uh, to Nottingham, Nottingham yeast. So trying a different yeast, see the different flavors to that. We fermented it for two days and tested it on the third. The appearance is the same, except the taste was very strong and herbal. We found out that that yeast strain, the yeast strain, was not as fruity or sweet as the Windsor yeast. They all have their own qualities. Yeah, they all have their own qualities. The one thing is also in the record, it's brewers tra trading yeast in the medieval period. When that did is, this yeast is good, give me some of that. Take this bad yeast, get rid of it. It happened. So the better yeast they had is what they used. Um, it was very powerful for the rosemary and yarrow coming through. A bit too much. It worked. It was all right, but just really not palatable after half a glass. So again, that was around three to three and a half percent. Again, like the, the results were rosemary and yarrow were too potent. And this also gets to the point where we realized that we're putting in the same amount of rosemary and yarrow as we would put the same amount of hops in a modern IPA which were a modern IPA, is focused on tasting hops. It's actually not what we wanted. So we had to fix that for the next batch as well and kind of calm down the yarrow and rosemary. So the final batch, which is what we have today, was cut the rosemary and yarrow in half, half the amount. We switched back to Windsor yeast, which has a much more fruity, sweet feeling to it. And we fermented it for two days and tried it at 7 o'clock this morning for the first time. <laughs> which is a great way to start the day before a conference. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, carried it in a taxi, spilling all over myself. So right now I smell like a brewery, it's wonderful. <laughs> what else is new? Uh, but however, this weekend there was a drop in temperature as we all probably felt. It was a very cold weekend and that does affect specifically this type of yeast where it either could stop fermentation or slow it down. So the final alcohol percentage is around one and a half, two percent. It's actually a very weak beer. The appearance is the same, as we'll see after. Um, the taste is light and zesty, but get more cereal through. Or did this morning. It's kind of changed since I've tried it since, too. It's still sort of doing crazy things. <laughs> it's transforming. It's transforming. Mm -hmm. But you do get more of the malt base and the oats coming through, as well as the yeast. It has a bit of sweetness to it as well. Of course, there's no carbonation, so it's really a flat, but bitter and zesty would be the way. Herbal porridge is how I described it. Flat. So try some. <laughs> Oh, so overall, throughout our entire process, um, the trials and errors in this experiment gave us a deeper understanding of medieval brewing, the art of brewing, and the lives of brewsters. Um, I, it, I hope you could perhaps follow that um, brewing was highly skilled, intuitive, and labor intensive in this time, especially without some of the scientific techniques and measurements of temperature and, and whatnot that we have available to us today. Um, so we gain not only a higher appreciation of medieval brewing, but also a higher appreciation of modern beer, the taste, <laughs> and modern brewing techniques, such as the efficiency. It was much more expensive to brew the medieval beer. Yes, yeah, as poor PhD students Three doing this was actually not months. a good idea. <laughs> Every time we brew a beer, the, the, the efficiency was so bad. I'm like, oh, those malts yeah. gone to waste. But no, it was good. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>